feel the darkness shaking All the dead are coming back to life We're back to life Hear the song awaken All creation singing We're alive Cause we're alive You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name and then my heart came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me And what a love we found Death can't hold us down We shout it out We're alive, you're alive And what a love we found Death can't hold us down We shout it out We're alive, you're alive Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at White Oak. And last week we started talking about a great church. What is a great church? And a great church would be a successful church. So what I'm going to do over the next few weeks, this is part two of being becoming a great church, is get into us becoming successful. Because remember, you and I make up the church. We are the church. So in order for the church to be successful or a great church, then that means that we've got to be successful people. And with that thought in mind, we're going to go right back to Acts chapter 2 tonight. And here we're using verses 37 through 47, which speaks about the first church, the early church, and all that the early church did. Tonight I'd like to focus on verse 42. Now verse 42 tonight says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, breaking bread, and prayers. I believe that those are the four ingredients here that's mentioned in the Word of God that makes the church great. And with that thought in mind, you know, uh, not only does a great church have converted members, we think about a church growing. Look at the early day church. You know, Peter preached one sermon, 3,000 souls were saved at one time. So what, what made all that possible? It's also a constant ministry. What makes a great church is that they, they're converted. Now, you have to be converted. Uh, you have to be born again. But then after, after conversion, you have a constant ministry. You don't stop. You know, it's not just a Sunday meeting or Wednesday night Bible study. But it's many different things made up during the week. Some things, some activities are at church. And some are away from church, like I've witnessed to people uh, on the job, and they've gotten saved. So the church house is not necessarily the place where we meet and people get saved. Because a growing church, a great church, a successful church, is a church that continues to go for God. Now, they continue steadfastly. Is, is the ministry in their life? Was that ministry in their life? I can honestly say to you tonight that the test of a revival meeting, you may have a lot of converts that week, maybe a lot of people saved during a revival meeting, and everybody gets excited over that because, well, that's the purpose of a revival. They say, no, it's not. The purpose of the revival is to revive the church, that we can go out and constantly win people to the Lord. So the revival is for the church. It's not for the sinners, not for the, uh, the community people that's walking. Even though community people come sometime, 
Revival is to revive us and set us aflame that we can get back and do what we can do. Because you see, during that week of revival, and say you have five people, ten people, 25 people get saved. During that revival, later on, the question is, is after a year, are those people still in your church? Are they still in a church? Are they still working for the Lord? Their conversion, have they been converted? Have they been born again? If so, then that means that they're growing. They're developing. They're in a church somewhere or another, making that a great church. They've come to the knowledge of the truth. They know the Lord, and they're working for the Lord. So revivals are great, but it's not for the sinner. It's for the church. And also, during that revival, don't get excited if you had seven people or 25 people get saved that week if they're not there a year later because that's what the mark is of a successful church. So that means after we get converted, the work's not over. It's just begun. After we get saved, we begin life's journey. So there are four characteristics I'd like to look at tonight in what makes a great, successful church and, and it growing for the Lord. And here in verse 42, it teaches us, the first one is they continued in their biblical teaching. We never can get enough of the Word of God. In other words, we never can learn enough about God. We're all the time studying the Word of God. We're all the time in the Word of God reading. We're not just reading to be reading, not to say that I've read the Bible through in one year, but we're reading in the Word of God so that we may develop ourselves and go out and share with other people. So then when we are a biblical teaching church, that means that we are a church that teaches the Word of God. Now, we're not to teach other things, and it, nothing wrong with teaching other things, but if we teach other things in the church, if we tell people how they can become successful in other ways, then we've missed our mark. I'm going to mention this again later on, but I want us to know something now. When we end life's journey and say that we've had a successful life, how much of the stuff that we've accumulated in this world, materialistic things in this world, are we going to take with us? So we learn that whatever we accumulate on this earth is not what makes us to be a successful individual. And however we've, we've trained. You know, I've been to these schools, I've been to these lessons, these seminars, where they all the time, you know, they talk about six points or 12 points to make you successful, to build a church, to make you a greater minister, to make you a, a greater, better Christian. And th there's nothing wrong with all of that. But if you don't fulfill it, follow through with it, then you miss the mark. So the basic thing in the church is we need to teach the truth. And why did I say basic? Because everything is built upon that base. There's one foundation, and though the church may do many things, if it ever veers from the truth of what it is founded on, and it is founded on the fundamentals of, of the church is the birth, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if we ever veer from that, we're veering from what God told us to teach because everything that we teach is based on this one essential thing. So what is it? It's a biblical teaching. Jesus said that you know the word, and the word would make you free. It's not coming to church that makes us free. It's not even reading the Bible, because you must understand what you are reading. You know, I was listening to a program the other night, uh, watching a TV program, and it was talking about when the Ethiopian was out in the desert and he was reading in Gaza. Well, you know, God called Philip from a great revival to go to that man. Well, I never really thought about the distance of that. You know, it weren't just down the road a few miles. He was 70 miles away reading that. And, that, and in through by that, that was one of the four people that had been translated in the Bible. Philip was translated by the power of God because it was a three-day journey to walk. So he was translated by the power of God to go witness to that man, and then God translated him back. See, that, see, I love Bible teaching like that. I like to know the whole story. And the problem uh, with churches not being a great church, a successful church, we get excited that people come to church, 
But what do we teach them when they come to church? We got to teach them the word of God. Because when they stand before God and when you and I stand before God one day, we're going to be held accountable for one thing. One is our salvation. And remember what Paul teaches us? That when we die, our works go with us and every man will be judged accordingly to the works that we have done in these bodies. So then therefore, a successful church is a group of people, bodies together, working, telling the truth. And the truth is what's making all of these people free. So we tell them about the birth of Christ. He is the word of God. He is the gospel. And that's what he told us to proclaim to the other most parts of the earth, not just in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria, but to the other most parts of this earth. And the exciting thing about this great church in the beginning, it was making history. It was writing a New Testament that you and I enjoy reading that's all about the church because all they had was the Old Testament. So their, their foundation was the Word of God. Their foundation was the Old Testament, and they were beginning to write the New Testament. And today, you and I, we live in the Old and the New Testament. Remember, Jesus said he didn't come to change anything. He came to fulfill the Old Testament, which was a foreshadowing of that which was to come. Kind of like Abraham's journey when God called him to go and find the promised land. That, that promised land that God talked to him about was a foreshadowing here on earth of the new Jerusalem, the heaven that was going to come down one day. So we, we need to be a church that continually teaches Bible truths. Now, we get involved in Sunday school. We get involved in worship service. We get involved in church services. We get involved in prayer services. And every one of these services are very important. You know, Bible teaching is important, but Bible studying is important also. You know, we don't just come to church an hour or 45 minutes or whatever, two hours, and say, well, I got all I need this week. I can go. The early church didn't do that. The Bible said they continued daily, daily. And that's what we have to do, daily attend a service with, with God. Now, there are all kinds of, of studies that we can have. I mean, we have children's church here. You know, not only do we have children's church and we have youth meetings here, we have worship service here, we have a regular uh, service here, we have Bible studies here. All of these are very important. We need, why? Because they are teaching. We're growing in the Lord. You know, somebody asked me one time why I went to Bible college, and I relate to them and said, well, this is the reason I went. Number one was for the wrong reason. And number one was <laughs> for me to get down at that point of my life, you know, and study, that's very difficult for me because I had so much on my plate. I had so much that I was doing that I would have never concentrated on the Word of God like I do today. I would, I would have never done it because I was so involved in so many other things. So what I did, I cleaned my plate, focused on going to Bible college, and that's all I did. I focused on Bible college. I was pastoring the church at the time, but at the same time, I was more involved in the Word of God. I didn't have other things that would distract me because I would have never, ever devoted my time to the Bible if I'd kept on doing what I was doing. It just wouldn't have happened. So then, therefore, that, that was uh, a reason for me, but also to get involved and know what the Word of God says. You know, there's so, so many translations of the Bible today, and a lot of people don't like that, but I think it's great. And there's so many authors out that are writing great books today, and a lot of people don't like that, but I think it's great. Because I think we should take the time to read and study the Word of God, and nothing will ever surpass the Word of God. That is it. But at the same time, I like to get other people's points of view. I like to listen to other people's. I, I know words. I can learn from other people as well. Other people that study the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit has inspired them to write books that we can read. Because if they are like the Word of God, written by men that were inspired by the Holy Spirit, that's how we got the Word of God. Men of old, holy men of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I, and I would like to think that when we teach at church or we preach at church or we minister outside the church, 
that we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, inspired by the Spirit of God, whether we're on the job, we can take time to witness to somebody. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of people in the world today that still got a lot of problems. But as we focus on this, I want us to realize something. I want us to realize we got to be genuine. And our genuine that I'm talking about comes through the truth, through the Word of God. And whatever you do as growing by biblical teachings, don't forget to pray. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. I'm, I'm going to give you a good example. One of the best examples I could give you is I read a story, and in reading this story, had a, uh, there was a little boy in there. And, and the little boy in that story, uh, he was curious because he'd went to church, and they were sitting in in a youth Sunday school class, children's Sunday school class, I think it's around six years old, something like that. And the question came up, who tore down the walls of Jericho? Well, the little boy, he, he, he'd heard that, you know. So he asked the Sunday school teacher. He said, Sunday school teacher, he raised his hand. He said, mister, tell me, who, to, who tore down those walls at Jericho? Well, you know what? The Sunday school teacher didn't know. He didn't know who tore down the walls of Jericho. You know, it was something that this little boy had heard that he had brought to class. And he said, I, I don't know who tore those. I, I know there were walls at Jericho, but I, I don't know who tore those walls down. But he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll find out this week. You come back next Sunday, and I'll tell you who tore the walls down at Jericho. He said, it's a deal. I'll be back next Sunday. I want to know who tore those walls down. So the Sunday school teacher goes to the Sunday school superintendent and asks the Sunday school superintendent, I was presented with a problem today. A problem? Yeah. Little boy in my class today, first day he's ever been, and he asked me a question that I couldn't answer. He said he wanted to know who, who tore down the walls of Jericho. He thought about it, and, so, and the Sunday school superintendent said, well, you know, I don't know who tore down the walls of Jericho. He said, but I'll tell you what. We'll, the, the deacon board is meeting tonight. We'll go out to the deacon board. I'll go with you, and we'll ask the deacon board who tore down those walls of Jericho. He said, okay, that sounds good. So they were meeting that night at 730, and they drove, and they went back, and and said, excuse us, we just have one question and we'll be out of everybody's way. We want to know who tore down the walls of Jericho. Uh, one deacon looked over to the other deacon. The other one looked over to the other deacon. And he said, well, <laughs> I really don't know. But I, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, you know, we do have some hoodlums. Some of our boys are like hoodlums around here. They're very destructive. We'll find out what group of boys tore those walls down. And don't worry about it. We'll handle this matter. But right now, we'll give you $25. We'll donate $25 to build those walls back up. I thought that was a hilarious story. But then I thought about how sad that story is. Because it wasn't the boys at church, we know that, that tore down the walls of Jericho. But we have a deacon board here. And then we have a Sunday school superintendent. And we have a Sunday school teacher. That a, a, a simple little young man asked a question in Sunday school about a simple little Bible story that all of us should know who tore down the walls of Jericho and nobody in that church knows. My friend, that settles my case to you tonight on why we need solid foundation teaching of the Word of God. Everything in the Word of God is so important. There was a purpose of the children of Israel marching around those walls. There was a purpose for God to level those walls. There was a purpose, the reason that God tore down those walls the way he did, and that church did not know it. We have to teach biblical lessons. They are very important. If you're going to step into the next world, you need to learn about the next world while you're in this world. If And other people that's in the community and surrounding areas of the church today if they ever expect to know anything about the next world, they need to know it now. And the only way they'll know it now is if we know about ourselves the next world and tell them about what the next world is all about. Because we know this is not the last world. This is an ending world. And the next world to come is our King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the one that we should be teaching them about because he's coming from the next world to this world to receive us back to himself. So we need good, solid, sound, biblical teaching. The church needs to know what it's teaching. Second thing that we need is we need continually steadfastness. It's there in verse 42, in fellowship. 
Fellowship is very important. I've learned there's a lot of lonely people outside the walls of the church. Sometimes there's lonely people in the walls of the church. And there are things that's going on in our world today uh, that we need to be able to share some of our fellowship in. People need to know who we are, that we are loving, that we are caring, that we are kind, and that we care for them. If you look up uh, fellowship in, in the Greek word, it means common. It means common. It means everybody, every need was met. Everybody had all things in common. In fellowship, what it was saying is we all have something in common. We may have different positions on the job. We may be of different ages. Some may be richer or poorer than other people, but we all have things that are in common. And the church, what made a great church was it was built up on people that had fellowship that had all things in common. We know things about each other. Though we're different, we know things about each other, and uh, we're not different. In other words, the Bible relates you and I as sheep. We're sheep, the sheep of his pastor, so that means sheep are sheep. It also relates us to another story. We are soldiers in the army of the Lord. So we're all soldiers. See how God puts us together. We have fellowship. Soldiers have fellowship. There's a general or an admiral, there, you know, or there may be just a private. See, but yet they all are soldiers. And they all have one thing in common as being soldiers is that they're there for one reason and one reason only, to protect our country. Well, we are soldiers in the army of the Lord. And we're here for one reason and one reason only. Though we do many things, our chief reason is we are to win souls for the kingdom of God. So we are in the army. So we're related in the Bible as being in the army of the Lord. I, my granddaughter today, I was there, and she wants, she loves to do that song, that little video that we're in the army of the Lord where everybody you know, marches, and she, she loves to see that. So, and I was streaming through so she could get the, the video of the children marching in the army, and she stands up and she marches, and she sings, right? She knows it well, you know, right along with it. That's the way we are in fellowship. You know, we march together, we sing together, we have fellowship together, even though, though our other statuses may be different in life. We may not have the same job, same occupation. We may not have. Some may be richer than others. Some may be poor than others, you know. It, it don't make any difference. We may be red, yellow, black, or white. It don't make no difference. So God looks at none of those things. I was listening to a pastor friend of mine um, the other night on TV, and he was talking about a child that had died, a baby boy. And he was born healthy, and he was beautiful. Well, our deacon's daughter uh, had a stillborn baby. Said the baby was uh, almost uh, nine months, ready, ready to come, but the baby was born dead. He said, you know... Our grandchild, our grandson came out, and, and he was white and, you know, beautiful. But this baby had died two days earlier in the womb of the mother. And when this baby came out, he was blue. He said, now I want to share, and this really blessed me. He said, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter if, if our, our baby is white or black or orange, Caucasian. It makes no difference. But he said, let me tell you, we don't want a blue baby. Because that blue baby was a dead baby. And what he was sharing in, in his message was we're all equal in the eyes of God. You know, our skin color, our pigment, God made every one of us. We were fearfully and wonderfully made by God. We were created by an awesome God. And the important thing is where are we going when we leave this world? God's not going to look and classify us in the color of our skin, our nationality, our race. He's not going to look at that. He's going to look at one thing and one thing only. Are we born again? That's what God's going to be looking. And that's why we need such great fellowship in the church. It's so that we all have all things in com common. We know all things, and if we don't know it, we ask a question so we would know it, so we have fellowship, so we'll be able to do those things together in the kingdom of, of, of God. So we need that fellowship. Now, again, fellowship... It's the most important thing. Think of it like this. You got education? What you're going to get out of education? You're going to get education, aren't you? 
If you have technology, what are you going to have out of technology? You're going to get technology. You're going to be able to get greater things out of technology. If you have science, what are you going to get out of science? You're going to get great things that are scientifically. And, and all of these things are very, I thank God for our technology, but I thank God also even more so for those that operate our technology. And who operates our technology are Christians. You know, there are people that's making this successful tonight for you and I to come together by the airwaves. Somebody's technology put a great satellite out there. You know, somebody's great uh, society put Facebook and YouTube, you know, where we're able to stream today and, and Internet, which we're on, that we can be, you know, all of this. See, that's technology. But technology leads to technology. Science leads to science. Education leads to education. And all of that is wonderful. But without the word of God, what value is it? Because one day it's all going to cease. Only through Christianity will we be able to be in the presence of the Lord, having fellowship with God. The early day church used whatever means that it had to promote the gospel, but they did it through fellowship. They became brothers and sisters together in the things of, of the Lord. They sang together. They washed feet together. They communed together. They, you know, worshiped together. They ministered together. They visited together. They just simply had fellowship. Preaching and teaching and singing and worshiping the Lord together. They were the sheep of God. Third thing in order for us to be a great church is they continued steadfastly. See, all of these, if you look here in verse 42, continuing steadfastly. All of these things, they continued. They continued. It's not a Sunday morning thing. It's not when I get time thing. They continued, it says here. And the third thing that they continued in, they, they broke bread. Now, you know, since we've gone through this pandemic and all this is around us today, we have involved in something that we used to do quarterly. And I don't know how God is going to direct us through this time and the changes that all of us are going through today, but we have begun to pick up one of our ordinances in church, and that's communion. You know, communion is one of the ordinances that God left us and told us to do as often as we will until he returns. And right now, we've picked it up where we don't do it quarterly. We do it every, every Sunday. And that's what the early day church did. They broke bread. And they didn't just go have a meal at somebody's house all the time and have fellowship together. They actually literally broke bread together with the Lord. And they were teaching through by that in how to share and how. Because when we do communion, Jesus had a word in the, in the King James. He says, remembering, remembering. We commune so we can remember what God did for us. That's what communion is, the breaking of the bread. The bread is his body. The, 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 the cup is the uh, blood that flowed for our salvation. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. All of that was done for, for you. So we remember that. Every time we take that, that bread and we take that cup, we go all the way back and remember the crucifixion of Christ, the price of our salvation. So they were constantly reminding themselves, my salvation isn't free. God paid for my salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus paid a debt that I could not pay. How, how did he do it? Well, let me show you. Come and commune with me. Come and break bread with me. So they continued steadfastly communing with the Lord, breaking bread daily with the Lord. For most people, you know, Wednesday night is an invisible night of church for most people, even before the pandemic. Wednesday night was, you know, because we have so many different segments in church, and we say, well, we can't attend, and we can't do all of that, you know. But are we an invisible church on earth, or are we a church that can be seen? For most people, the invisible church, they, make, they take Wednesday night to make the invisible church. Well, I thank God for technology because if you've had a busy day and can't come to church, then you can view us on your screen and be able to see this service tonight. But I don't believe, and now let me say this, and don't get me wrong when I say this, I don't believe you're going to miss heaven if you don't go to church. You never thought I would say that, did you? You know, I don't think you will because the only requirement is not church because I'm afraid there may be people in church that don't make heaven. They may attend church every Sunday faithfully, 
where every time the doors are open. And they still may miss heaven. So I'm saying, in, in a sense, that I don't think you have to go to church in order to get to heaven. But let me put it this way and share with you a story. What's Jesus coming back for? He's not coming back for my job. Even if I'm involved in the church, he's not, he, don't want, he don't want to come back for my job. He's coming back for his church, his bride. Kind of like these two boys. They were standing outside one day, and they were looking up in the air, and there was a big old jet, 747, flying through the air. One little boy looked over to him, and he looked up, and he said, You know what? I sure am glad I'm not up there in heaven in that plane right now. The other boy looked back over, and he thought a minute, and he said, And yet, you know what? I'm glad I'm not up there and not in that plane. And what he was saying was, the one little boy was afraid of flying, so he wouldn't want to be up there flying in that plane. And the other little boy told him, he said, well, yeah, I, I see your point, but you know, if I'm up there, I'd want to be in that plane because that plane is taking me where I need to go. You know, I want to be in the church. You know why? Because when we read in Acts, the church is Christ's people. We're his children. We're the body of Jesus Christ. We are the kingdom of, of God. Yes, I know about Jesus, but I like to assemble and have fellowship with other people that know about Jesus also. I want to go to heaven, and when, and when I go, I want to be able to go with everybody the way that Jesus wants me to go with everybody, and that is through the church. We're going through the church, the bride of Christ, whether we have died or whether we are still alive. The Bible says it's the church is going to be, the saints of God is going to be resurrected. Now, to be a saint of God, you, you don't have to be a church member. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that if you were a saint of God, saved, wanting to witness and work for the Lord, would you not get involved with God's ministry? Jesus told us when he came to this earth for us to go out and do likewise. Every, every Sabbath, Jesus was in a church teaching, every Sabbath. He never went by the church without teaching in, in the church. So I, I see the importance of church. Is it necess the necessity for salvation? No. But why would we not want to go to church? If it is presented to us that his son, Jesus Christ, upon this rock, he said, I will build my church. Upon the word of God, I will build. At Hebrews 10, 25, I had a pastor once that that was his favorite scripture. Fail not to assemble yourselves together and even more so when you see that day approach it. So I'm just saying, I believe if we're saved, we want to go to church. We want to get involved in church and do church things. Fourth thing I want to end with tonight and share with you tonight is prayer. I mentioned it slightly a few times, but they continued steadfastly in their prayer. Prayer is the powerhouse of the church. We can do a lot of things in church, but prayer is the powerhouse. Jesus teaches us to talk to him. He said, you have not because you ask not or you ask the miss. Prayer is the powerhouse that we have that he said even moves mountains. You know how many people outside the walls of this church that needs prayer every day? And they won't come to this church to get prayer. They won't even come to this church to ask. But God puts you and I there beside them so we can pray with them and teach them the power of prayer. See, it's the power of prayer that changed things. Jesus says, ask in my name, and it shall be given. We can't do without it, you know. We, we just simply can't. There are certain things, you know, we went a long time without technology, so we know we can, we can go without technology. Now, technology enhances, I believe, the ministry of God. It's one of the tools of God. But I can tell you there's one thing we never, ever can get along from the day we're saved till the day we go to be with the Lord, and that's prayer. How do you talk to God every day if you don't pray? How do you, you know, we, we teach our children when they are little, the little simple prayers. Well, we need to teach them more than the simple prayers. We need to teach them the power of prayer. 
how it will move a mountain in a life. Someone that's terminally ill or someone that has just lost a loved one. We need to teach them the comforting words of the power of God and ask that his Holy Spirit would come in and flood a heart that's been devastated and broken. It's done out of love. It's done out of talking to the Lord. Try prayer and you can get things done. If you tried everything else, just stop and try prayer. Talk to the Lord. And by the way, though, you got to be saved because God listens to his children's prayer. I promise you, I challenge you to talk to the Lord. And if you're not saved, I'm challenging you, talk to the Lord tonight. Tell him that you're a sinner. Ask him, invite him into your heart and life and tell him that you need him to save you. You need him to guide you every day. You need his power. You're not able to control the enemy that's come against you. You need his help. And you only get it through by prayer. And when you pray, he says, pray to our Father that are in heaven. So we pray upward. We pray towards heaven. Our Savior is at the right hand of Jesus right now. Forever making intercession. Forever he is our high priest interceding for you and I. So it's not a spectacular service. It's not a good time at praise and worship. It's not a good message that the preacher had preached today that's going to carry us through the week. No, it's daily communicating, daily praying to our Father in heaven. There was a constant ministry. You know, one of the things that's very exciting to me about the early day church was they were writing history. They were writing our church history. They were writing the New Testament. They were making it all come together. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I have it. We have the Word of God, the Old and the New Testament together. We can get it in whatever translation, whatever language almost we want to today. So we got it made. There's no excuse why we cannot be a great church. We have the tool handed to us that the early day church put together and floor matted for us, handed it to us on a platter. Now God's telling us to go with it and go out into the world, you know. And how do we do it? We have converted members. We have a constant ministry. It don't stop on just a, a service during the week, you know. And then we have continued multiplication. And what that is, we're out there winning souls. Not just at a camp meeting or revival meeting or a service at church, but we meet people every day that need Jesus, need him in their life. And that's what makes a great church when we begin to do that. When Billy Graham, many years ago, went to Tokyo, he went there to win souls in Tokyo because he was an evangelist. Well, in order for that to happen, they, in Tokyo at the time, there were 16,000 Christians. I was astonished when I read and I, read and I studied it. See, I tell you, reading is great. Reading the Word of God, it's great. Read it, you'll find out who tore the walls of Jericho down. And he, there were 16,000 Christians in Tokyo. Well, when he, weeks before he arrived there, there was a, a great assembly and they had gotten together. And what the Billy Graham Association has asked to do is that the Christians, the 16,000 Christians would visit the homes every home in Tokyo before the crusade came to tell them about the crusade that was coming. Now, at that time, there were three and a half million homes, three and a half million homes in Tokyo, 16,000 Christians, three and a half million homes in, in Tokyo. So that meant that every Christian would have to visit 219 homes, each one of them would have, in order for all those people to know about the crusade coming. You know what? They did it in three weeks. 16,000 people in three weeks. Each one of them individually visited 219 people. Two and a half million homes were visited. And the crusade went, and it was successful. Just like the early day church. They, those 16,000 people had all things in common. They were a great church. They, weren't a, they were a one church, but there were diversity of churches there. You know, there were several other churches, but they came together as one 
and 219 homes were visited by each individual, and the crusade went on, and thousands and thousands and thousands were saved. I'm telling you, the church has gotten along with society sometimes today. They measure success incorrectly. They measure success by money. Just because you got a lot of money doesn't mean that you're successful, my friends. There are many ways that we measure success that are wrong. There's only one right way to measure success. And we're going to get down and get involved in that in, in the next few weeks to come because in order to have success, I want us to look at these things and, you know, find your dream. Find your dream. In other words, your calling, your destiny in life, find, find out whatever it is. Find it. And when you find your dream of life, then you'll find your purpose for being here. I mean, you just weren't born to be mourned. God will give every one of us a dream. Some of us need to become dreamers like Jacob was. We need to become a dreamer like him or like Joseph. Joseph, he dreamed. We need to find the purpose. Why am I here? And then you need to set your goal. So then you need to find what are you looking for out of life? What's got goal given to you in life? What's your purpose for being here? You know, why is God, you know, I believe everybody, because the Bible says when you continue to read this, and the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved, we go, we're all involved in a special church. You know, this church is special to me. Your church is special to you. No matter what position that you hold, God puts you there. God puts you there. So with that thought in our mind, I want us to get ready in the weeks to come to see the advancement that we can make if we'll do those three simple things find our dream our purpose for being where we are set your goals and set them high and then you'll be able to have the achievement that you've always wanted remember if your achievement is making money that's okay you're just not going to be able to take it with you it won't make you happy life journey i found out many years ago brother and sister is a lot more fun when you know where you're going. It's a lot more fun. My life became a lot more fun when I found out that I weren't going to hell and I was going to heaven. It became a lot more enjoyable. I didn't say it was easier or more peaceable, but it was a lot more enjoyable to know that I had been exempt from hell and my name had been written in the land's book of life. Life became a lot more enjoyable. So this is what we're going to look at in the weeks to come. We're going to look at know your purpose, and in that purpose, grow to your maximum potential. And while you're doing that, sow a few seeds along the way. Sow a few seeds. That's what God's got you for. Remember that we can sow those seeds. Now, about some will fall on rocky ground. Some will fall by the wayside. But all the time, God, God didn't tell you to create those people. That's his job. He said, I'm going to give you the seed. The seed is the gospel. It's the word of God. I want you to sow it. And if you'll sow my seed, I'll take care of the rest of it. Because I'm going to send somebody along to water that seed. I'm going to send somebody else. See, that's why we're so important as a church. Because some of you are cultivators in here. Some of you are going to give a little bit of fertilizer to somebody's life. See, that's what makes a great church. That's what makes a successful church. Because when we sow our seeds, our seeds don't just benefit us. It benefits others. Because, you see, we didn't have any seed. Jesus gave us our seed. Freely I've given unto you. You go out and do likewise. Somebody sowed a seed in my life. I know who it is. You know who sowed the seed in your life? But I had to develop that seed. And how I developed that seed was, yeah, I went to church. And I stayed in church, not because I'm a pastor, but that's because that was my not original dream. When I was 21 years old, I weren't where I needed to be. My dream weren't being a pastor by no means. You said my wife will tell you that. My dream was far from that. But God gave me a dream. He gave me a vision. And for 45 years, I've been following that dream. I've been following that goal. I've been falling into the potential of that. And if all of us would let God lead us, let me tell you what's going to happen in closing. 
then we'll become a great. And a great church is a successful church because it's a church for God. So my friend tonight, I, I say unto you, as we begin to take our journey, are you on the right road? Are you in a great church that's teaching the word of God, that's having the fellowship that God would have it to have, breaking bread daily and praying? You know, we have Wednesday prayer. Ladies gather out here and pray every Wednesday. Every night at 9 o'clock, my wife and I, we'll kneel in our, our living room on our ottoman and we'll pray. We don't just pray every now and then. Prayer is a daily process, process that we go through to say, God, I'm praying for my country right now. God, change my country. Change those men and women. Change them. Many of them are lost, selfish. Give them love. Crush those hearts that are cold and hard and soften them. Only the word of God can do that. Church, that's why we're left here. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to study your word again this night. I thank you for those that are listening, those that are viewing, that are watching us tonight and listening to us. And God, our, our ambition, our desire here at White Oak is that everybody be able to hear the word of God. And God, you have blessed us with the means. You have provided the finances, the people, the technology. You have made a way. And God, now it's up to us. It's up for us to deny ourselves and take up that cross every day and answer the calling that God's got on our life, even though it may be uncomfortable, even though it may upset what we plan to do, because that's the only way we can become a great church, a successful church. And when we become a great church and a successful church, it's a church that's doing what God wants us to do. Talking about the birth, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is our salvation. So many people need to know that. Thank you for giving us the opportunity for being able to share that. And if there's anybody listening to me tonight, Father, I pray they don't listen to me, but they listen to the word as the Holy Spirit touches their heart tonight. If they don't know you, Lord, I, I pray that they'll pray and invite you into their heart and life. Bless those Christians that's out every day. Supply the needs, Lord, for their families and their friends, that the gospel of God may go forth. And we'll be back here Sunday again, your will, Father, lifting you and giving you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.